Good evening, uh, and welcome to all our, our guests and attendees uh, around the world and in every time zone. So I should also say good morning and good afternoon as well. Uh, my name is Rahul Parson. I am uh, assistant professor of Hindi at UC Berkeley in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. And it is my great honor uh, this evening to serve as moderator and introducer um, for tonight's event in the Tagore celebration. Um, this, this festival is being presented under the aegis of the Tagore program on literature, culture, and philosophy at UC Berkeley. And we hope you join us for the rest of the events um, and, and that if you miss any, that you, you uh, know that you can come to the website and um, watch these events after the fact. Um, the Tagore program was launched in fall of 2020, the first of its kind in the US. <clears throat> the Tagore program is designed to showcase the life and the legacy of Rabindranath Tagore. The program will sponsor talks and workshops on Tagore, as well as other public events. It will also fund a semester long visiting professorship in Tagore studies at UC Berkeley. The festival will end on February 14th. And for more information on the festival, visit the webpage at southasia.berkeley.edu forward slash celebrating Rabindranath Tagore. Uh, so a few words about how this evening will proceed. Um, we will, after my brief introduction, we will have about 40, uh, 40 minutes of music followed, about, followed by about 15 minutes of question and answer. Uh, in order to ask a question, uh, please utilize the Q&A box to type your question and then I will read these to our, our performer, Shohana Bajpai. Okay, let me say a few words about uh, our distinguished performer. Shohana Bajpai was brought up and trained in Rabindra Shungit and Bengali folk music and song known as Baal music at Sh uh, Shantina Ketan in West Bengal. With 20 years of performance experience, she now travels the world singing and collaborating with musicians from different countries. She has released five critically acclaimed studio albums to date, and recently several popular singles. <clears throat> Her work primarily involves Rabindra Shungi performances with more contemporary soundscapes, an update that is particularly celebrated by the younger generation of Rabindra Shungi listeners. She thus endeavors to create a bridge between the existing Bengali music culture and contemporary, the contemporary generation of music enthusiasts. In 2007, she introduced a new generation to Rabindu Shungit with her first album, Notun Kore Pabo Bole, published uh, in Dhaka in 2007, as I said. Shohana Bajpai was awarded the Bengal's Pride Award in 2018 in the House of Commons in the United Kingdom Parliament for her contribution to arts and culture. Bajpai has performed widely in India, in Bangladesh, in Europe and America, at prestigious venues such as the Royal Albert Hall, the Royal Festival Hall, University of Cambridge, SOAS, University of London, the London School of Economics, the Grassi Museum of Leipzig, Univ uh, University of Bonn, University of Halle, um, also in Poland, as well as concerts in Paris, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Zurich, Stuttgart, and various North American cities, the list simply goes on. She is now based in London. She teaches Bengali language and literature at SOAS, University of London. And she holds an MA both from SOAS, uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies, and the Vishwa Bharati University in Shantini Ketan. Presently, Bajpai has taken leave from SOAS to pursue a PhD in music at King's College London. She is working uh, broadly on Robindo Shungit performance. I was struck reading her bio uh, by a line she wrote, which is both endearing and enviable. She writes, if she had her life to do again, she would not change very much. <clears throat> so with no further ado, uh, let the concert commence. I give you Shohana Vajpai. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining 
today to listen to us. I feel very touched and honored to have been invited to perform at the prestigious Tagore Festival organized by UC Berkeley Institute for South Asian Studies. I myself had done my master's in South Asian Studies from SOAS and my classmate, my very dear friend Vasugi, now teaches at UC Berkeley. She teaches South Asian Studies as well. Um, I was I feel quite like a fish out of water, you know, in this list of such distinguished speakers, which gave me a fright, you know, whose works I have read and marveled at. But at the same time, I feel extremely grateful that I could sing to you. My gratitude is deeply towards Dr. Shokti Dash, my dear Shokti Da. Thank you for thinking of me for this event. And I extend my grateful, my gratitude to Punitha, Dr. Punitha Kala, as well as everyone else involved in this celebration. Today, I'll be joined with my bandmate. We always play together. His name is Shoptik Mojumdar, who will play the piano. And I'll sing you a few songs and I'll try to talk to you about my journey and what I know, what I have known or what I have sensed through this journey of my singing of Tagore songs. Tagore once wrote in a letter to Durjoti Prashad in 1935. You know, I'm ruthlessly modern where music is concerned. By which I mean, I do not subscribe to preserving the sanctity of conventional forms and rituals. Rabindranath, as Kobi Schumann, the seminal singer-songwriter of our times, says, he locates Rabindranath's songs as well as Rabindranath's contemporary Dijendralal Rai's song within the structural idioms of Adhunik Bangla Gan, modern Bengali songs. Rabindranath himself resolutely defined his songs as Adhunik while writing in defense of his compositions vis-a-vis -vis Hindustani classical music. He wrote to Dilip Kumar Roy, with whom, he, uh, with whom his debates on music have been written about frequently. He requests Dilip Kumar Roy, I quote, Please give a special name to my Adhunik songs, to my modern songs. The indicators of the term Adhunik in both the references is undeniably straightforward and clear. It is perceptible that an archaic label or a classical tag would not reasonably define Rabindranath songs. However, there was no need to search elsewhere as a special name was being formed, taking from the author's name itself, Rabindra Shongit, songs by Rabindranath. And Shotanarath Rai says, modern songs, quote, I quote, modern songs authored by Rabindranath for which Rabindra Shongit, the name, is not only accurate, but it also adds significance to the genre. So Rabindranath was quite aware of himself as a modern singer-songwriter. And he was also very critical of the urban music of his times, which heavily hinged on either traditional Hindustani classical music or contained, I quote from Shudhir Chakraborty's book, distasteful melody and rhythm and unseemly subject matters. And musical entertainment was deemed generally to be shallow um, and soulless. Um, so Rabindranath, uh, sort of, his attitude was, you know, he sort of set himself up as a defender of musical democracy. Uh, and Shoto Jitrai points out in his Rabindra Shongite Bhabbar Gotha article that was published in Ekkhon Potrika, uh, that his Rabindranath's attitude was one of rebellion against an institutionalized tradition. 
His reliance was on a non-academic instinctive. Tagore went on to successfully assimilate in his music some of the foundational structures of North Indian classical musical tradition and the South Indian Carnatic school of music and also those of the local popular slash folk traditions both urban like Toppa, Torja, Kobigan and so on and rural like Panchali, Jatra, Baul, Bhatiali and of course Kirtan. While he also at one point generously borrowed from the western musical tradition. In doing so he effected a sort of democratization of Bengali music quite single-handedly although his hands were held musically by the uh, general Al Rai, Otul Pushat Shen, Rajani Ganto, and later Nazrul Islam. Uh, so his songs, Robin Shangit, flourished into being a part of the identity of a particular section of 20th century Bengali urban educated middle class. Um, I would like to talk about how Tagore's music is relevant to our times because of its inherent modernity, of its compositions, of, his, of the way it is contemporary as well as songs from the past. In ja- on January 6th in 2020, in response to the previous night's state-sponsored barbarism, we in, in Jorlan Nehru University, uh, you know, the, there was against, it was against the students there and um, it threatened the country's secular and democratic fabric. Many of us in Shantaniketan, a group of, a strong group, group of teachers and students gathered in solidarity in Vishwabharati University, Shantaniketan. And here, to lend our voices of support to the nationwide surge of protest and also to resolve to commit ourselves to the cause, we congregated and sang our hearts out. The tradition in Shantaniketan is to sing Tagore songs in unison in protest. And we sang amongst many, like Marish Shagor. The first song we did was Bidir Badhun Kad Betumi, Amon Shoktiman. While Tagore wrote this in 1905 during the Swadeshi movement, he wrote this, uh, and he, this, this song was uh, specifically reported by the Bengal intelligence branch to be censored by the British government. Um, the song criticizes the hubris of the government and asks defiantly whether the government can consider itself to be truly shoktiman or powerful. It's a brilliantly hard-hitting song, and while we sang it, we knew that the song was a song of our times. His creative response was autonomous, but Robin Rad never lost sight of the call of the spirit of the age, especially of all the crisis in the music industry and outside of it. When we were growing up in the 90s, this is how I come to the picture, we noticed that there were many singers, songwriters bringing out their albums like Kobe Schumann, Anjan Dotto, Nochiketa, and Mohinir Goraguli's music we were listening to. You know, semi- there were singer songwriters, and we thought, you know, they were playing their guitars and they were singing their songs. And people were listening to a lot of Bollywood music as well in those days. But Ravindranath's music was not heard that much by the generation that I was growing up in. Of course, I was growing up up in Shantiniketan where we always sang Rabindranath, which was not put on us, but we did. And what we realized is we need to sort of, we can sing Rabindranath's song with the piano, with a guitar. And that's where my thirst for creativity and desire for innovativeness crept in along with a few friends of ours as far as the musical arrangements were concerned. And we were a bunch of enthusiastic postgraduate students of Bishubharati Shantaniketan, uh, who were hugely inspired by these songwriters and the band music. We sort of recorded an album, and it was 2001, the copyright 
was going to be ended on 31st December and on the 1st of December we made these CDs and on the 1st of December there's this mela, there's this fair called Nondon Mela in Kuala Bhavan in the Fine Arts Department. We sold these CDs. We were not gaining any money from it, you know, the, the money went to underprivileged students' funds. And the registrar's office came and said, you can't sell it because you have not got any approval from the Bishwati Music Board. They still hold the copyrights. And we said that it's just a homemade CD and they're all sold out. And this is how our little rebellion started. Um, and I started to sing Rovinrath songs with a kind of soundscape that was more relatable to our times without hampering the authority of the author's notations. We sang the way we had been taught in Shantanigatan to sing full throttle with all our hearts, with all our minds, understanding the lyrics, which was very important. And this little act of rebellion prodded me along to sing Ravanrath songs. So today, I would like to start to sing for you a very, very favorite song of mine. Thank you. The first song that I'm going to sing to you today is a proof that how Rabindranath's songs still resonate with our times and the emotions that we are going through. This particular song became very, very close not, to, not only to my heart but to a lot of other people who kept on singing this song and I saw them on social media it sort of became the quintessential song for the pandemic times. The song was written in 1918 in Raga Behag. The first time that this song was sung that we have um, proof of is when Shita Devi is writing about a particular day of Sri, Ch Sri Panchomi of Saraswati Pujo in Shantaniketan and the children of the school, the students of the school had gone for a picnic to Shurul and Shurul is a little village near Sriniketan and when they came back they went to meet Rabindranath and this impromptu meeting turned into nothing other than a gun and Adar Ashur. And Shita Devi says that Rabindranath sang, Gurudev sang this song himself that day and he told us that he had written it on that day. A song that was written in 1918 is still pertinent for our times, especially these times. Jani Bundhu 
song that I'm going to sing today is a Kittonango song and he wrote this song when he was 64 years old in 1925. This song was included in his play Shodhbud where the character Nolini sings it. It is a song, it's a song of love. Once again marked by its inclusion under the section Prem in his book of songs, Gita Bitan. The idea of classical ragas and raginis disseminating pure music with their rigorous loyalty to gharanas and craftsmanship flows seamlessly with Bengali folk tunes in many of Rabindranath's compositions that were later termed as Kirtanango, Ongo meaning in the form of a Kirtan song. Rabindranath was mindful of the historical Bengali affection for songs of intense self-expression. He construed that this affection of the Bengali people and their inability to blindly adhere to the system of Hindustani classical music actually 
necessitated the formation of the spiritual musical genre kirtan kirtan was passionate creation of the bengalis and rabindranath was very fond of the independent spirit that was entrenched in kirtan especially because they retained the innate essence of traditional ragas and raginis it was within the larger parameters of kirtan that rabindranath found the genesis of the bengali song and he went on to fashion and theorize his own compositions in his repeated locating of the root of the bengali song in kirtan also lies in his conscious act of anchoring bengali songs within a pre-colonial genealogy she amar go Rabindranath, as we all know, responded 
to the spirits of his times, and musically so, more often. This song is again a song of love, under the section which is unambiguously titled Prem in the Gita Vitan. It's based on Raga Bhoirobi and the rhythmic cycle, the Tal is Dadra, from Tagore's play Prayushchitto. The tune was borrowed from the traditional North Indian classical Thungri, Banake Batia, which was very popular in the times with the courtesans of Varanasi, Lucknow and Kolkata. There is a rendition by a very well-known courtesan of Kolkata in the early 20th century, Krishna Bhamini Dashi, which was recorded in 1915. And Rabindranath did not approve of this recording. But this is also the case that the courtesans lived in northern Kolkata's Bobajar and Jitpur areas in the colonial times and they had ardent fans in the Tagore family as well as many other aristocratic families of Kolkata. So this is a Tungri that Tagore borrowed and made into a beautiful love song which was written in 1909 Oje Manena Mana Ami jato boli tabe 
I would like to thank um, Shoptik, who is playing the p piano with me. Uh, we chose the piano especially because Rabindranath was very fond of the instrument, and in his memoirs, when he talks about Jyotirindranath playing on his piano, and they were experimenting with writing songs, um, he talks about Giti Biplob, Shongit uh, Andolon, and um, um, he always preferred uh, his songs to be played either in the, on the piano or the estrage or a cappella. Um, we love the piano because it goes with the songs very much and even the shorulipis were done most of the time while the piano was played by Dinandranath Thakur or Indira Devi. My next song is um, a song that was also written in 1909 on the rag behag again Tagore's fav one of say Tagore's favorite ragas and the rhythmic cycle is Jamtal. It's a Hindi bhanga gan which is taken from a Hindi uh, a Hindustani uh, classical musical tradition um, song a drupad and the song was uh, first sung um, in, uh, in at the Brahma Samaj for a Maghut shop there festival. Um, the song celebrates a kind of wonder, uh, wondrous surrender to the Maharaj, the King, um, the omni, Omnipresent, I suppose. <coughs> Excuse me. I um, I I had sung this song and recorded in, uh, in uh, 2015 and. Um, the national award-winning uh, director of uh, West Bengal, Srijit Mukherjee, used it in his 2018 movie, Agjichilo Raja, um, which explores the Kumar of Bhawal's curious court case that has been explored in Partho Chatterjee's A Princely Imposter. Um, the song um, is very close to my heart and I love singing it. I hope you enjoy it too. Oh. 
written in 1922 which retains a lot of protest energy and strength in it Romit Rai had mentioned in one of his articles that Rabindranath's compositional methodology was a conscious act a conscious political act which persistently tried to tackle effectively the critical process of identity formation and intentionally valorizing the traditionally authentic cultural practices as a direct rejoinder to what is perceived to threaten it rabindranath therein lies the origin of rabindranath's consciously crafted technique for the songs that he had written essentially against the colonial government um it lent him a, he crafted a technique which not only assisted him to form a bengali identity but which has also lent him the voice to i quote sing bengal into a nation quoted by ezra pound rabindranath felt the impassioned pull of the religious syncretism woven into the bengali indigenous baul musical philosophy and he sought to understand the community through their songs he liberally borrowed the tunes especially from kushtia's gogon horkora horkora that are repetitive but steeped in emotional sincerity lending his own words to them in the set of songs composed in the wake of anti-colonial movements In Rabindranath's numerous writings, debates and letters, public addresses and discussions, his musical agenda clearly comes across there. His was a deliberate attempt to try and establish within the meta narrative of the Indian nationalist movement a parallel narrative recounted through his musical compositions. This song is a baul song a song at the tune is baul and um it was used in his play mukto dhara where dhanon joy boiragi sings the song we in these times have sung this song over and over again even before the pandemic have started the atrocities that were going around this song was sung in unison over and over again I'm going to sing this song to you a song of strength a song of protest for me and for many more Ami mare re sagor pari debo go ei bishom jorer bai amar bhoy bhangai nae ami mare re sagor pari debo go এই বিষম ঝড়ের বাই আমার ভয় ভাঙাই নাই আমি মারের সাগর পাড়ি দেব গো মা ভয় বানির ভরসা নিয়ে ছেড়া পালে বুক ফুলিয়ে গো মা ভয় বানির ভরসা নিয়ে ছেড়া পালে বুক ফুলিয়ে গো তোমার ওই পারে ওই পারতে যাবে তোরি ছায়া বটের ছায়ে আমি মারের সাগর পাড়ি দেব গো 
এই বিষম ঝড়ের বায়ে আমার ভয় ভাঙাই নাই আমি মারের সাগর পাড়ি দেব song that was written in 1887 which was scored by Jyotirindranath Thakur Tagore's elder brother as i've mentioned um this song um uh, is a generous melod- melodic borrowing from the scottish poet robert burns who according to omrit shen was already made popular by the colonial scots in 19th century bengal who apparently made up 60% of the merchants awarded the East India Company's permit to do business here. The rise of Henry de Rosio, a Portuguese radical thinker of his time, the principal of Hindu college, and the one, uh, one of the first Indian educators to disseminate Western learning and science among young men of Bengal, also was the chief trigger for burns popularity in the region as as the representative of a sort of bardic nationalism that amritsen talks about evidently uh, the budding poet rabindranath uh, translated four of burns's poetry and his adaptation of burns songs were transferring of melodies to suit his own cultural milieu without any particular consonance with the originals or tracing burns scottish nationalism in 1887 rovenrath wrote purano she diner gotha appropriating the tune of burns's old lang syne As a performer of Rabindranath Sangeet I have wit- witnessed time and again that this has come to become it has become an unofficial anthem of the Bengali community in the Bengali speaking regions of South Asia as well as the Bengali diaspora every Bengali pertaining to the mid- middle brow section knows the words and the tune and tends to sing it sing it in social gatherings as the parting song The audience in Ramana Sangeet concerts request the artists repeatedly to perform the song while they sing along in unison. <coughs> Old Lang Syne is always sung in unison while people hold hands as a farewell tune and also while celebrating New Year's Eve as I've seen in the UK and in the United States. In its Bengali version it is in greater proximity to its original which basically retains the original sentiment of nostalgic longing and gratitude and friendship fitting it into a more localized ambience with traces of the raga bhupali 
I would now sing the song as the last song of this evening. I hope to come back and sing for you again. I would like to thank everyone before I go for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think I speak for everyone, Shohanev, uh, expressing our gratitude, Onek Donobad, for a lovely concert and, uh, um, and of course, lovely uh, stories and anecdotes in between. Um, at this point, um, I'd like to take a few minutes. I mean, we've run over time, but I think uh, we can take another 10 minutes and um, and uh, give um, Shohana a chance to uh, address some of the questions from, from the audience. And um, I, again, if you have a question, please use the Q&A box. And uh, the first question uh, that's actually been here for a little while is from uh, Waz Waziuddin Chaudhry. Uh, and he says, uh, he writes, I applaud your effort to reach out to the contemporary audience the question is whether you have attempted to do a, a damar of Tagore with modern percussion. And if you did, uh, do you think it conveyed the spirit of his creation? Um, as, as many people know, Tagore was particular of Tal's and even created many of them by himself for his songs. So this is a question about percussion. So um, if you could please uh, unmute your mic, please, uh, Shohana. And, um, and uh, yes, please. <coughs> Hello, thank you, Rahul, and thank you, everyone who has who has been watching <coughs> the performance. I'm sorry about my voice. Um, it's not; it's a bit tough scurvy today. But uh, um, yes, I mean, reaching uh, to the audience, to the younger generation, was so seamlessly merged with the kind of lifestyle we were leading in the 90s that it did not feel like oh 
I think you've I think you've frozen, Shauna. Um, well, as, as we wait a moment for um, Shahana's uh, uh, video to unfreeze, thaw out, as it were, um, I, I want to apologize. I forgot to do so for our technical difficulties early, and I'm reminded as we are experiencing them again, one of the shortcomings of our moments, and also uh, uh, offer a debt of gratitude to Ponita for, for fixing our initial technical problem. Um, Okay, let's see what has happened. I think uh, Shahana is just rejoining. Ah, oh, there you are, good. Un unmute, please. Sorry, this is sketchy. Shantani gets on internet, I suppose. We just got off for a bit. So yeah, I mean, you know, I, I myself as a performer, I don't think that, uh, I, I very much rely on the on the uh, listeners because you know whatever we do you know adding drums or you know uh, things into Robin Shongi that are not particularly there written by the author <clears throat> to contemporize it <clears throat> I think the listeners are um, discerning enough to understand that what is uh, what they want to listen to and what they don't want to listen to and uh, to sort of completely uh, go off track uh, in experimentation. I mean, anybody can do it now. The copyright has been lifted uh, 20 years ago. But uh, after all, we as performers survive on our listeners' choices and what they want to listen to, you know, and what they like to listen to. And I don't think um, any, any diversion, any, you know, radical diversion, from the performance practices that have been there for the last hundred years now. This genre has been practiced for, you know, for a long, long time now. I don't think anything is going to sort of be detrimental to, to, to the performance's progress, if you know what I mean. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> that answer. Um, now I'm delighted to, uh, to relate to you a question of, from my colleague and your dear friend, um, Vasugi. She writes, this was a wonderful session and thank you uh, for, for such a nuanced context to all the songs. Uh, my question is, how do you place Tagore's musical legacy in the age of booming musical recreation with spaces like YouTube? Uh, can you speak a little about reaching out to, a younger, to younger audiences in these spaces and what has that reception been like? Well, thank you Vasu and thank you for listening. Um, I do think that uh, it is, again, you know, going back to the same thing that I was talking about, YouTube is now the space where listeners go and listen to songs. And uh, listening has become much of watching as well, you know, the first, you know, to see and listen. And, you know, there are different people make nicely catered videos with Robin Rath's music. I have myself also been in songs that have, you know, videos that <clears throat> that have been a lot of money spent behind them for for YouTube purposes. But I think I, to be honest with you, if, if I if you ask me that how do you do this, how do you engage younger generations, I would very honestly tell you that there is a you know there's you have to be with the times. Tagore himself said this, that the music that you're doing has to be with the times. And the recreations that happen, you know, much of them are discarded, but many are accepted by the listeners. So <clears throat> I suppose we have to sort of create a right balance to sort of reach out to the listeners of our times and also not jar <clears throat> its historical um lineage if you if you uh, if you get my drift and as far as i am concerned i reach out to my audience with uh i think uh how i learned music in tantani Gevan, to sing from your heart and your mind and i was told over and over by my music teachers my gurus that you know if you if you don't understand the words <clears throat> of the goes music and you sing it the people who are listening to you can understand that you don't get it. So the first thing I think is to 
to sing, to, to be really cerebral about Rabindranath's song's performances <coughs> and try and understand um, sort of what he's wanting to say and how he's trying to sort of weave the tala and the bhava and the melody into it. And I think, uh, you know, if you are there in that position, people respond, whether it's on YouTube or Spotify or Facebook. Um, the, the crux of it is that to be honest with what you're doing, with your art especially. That's a very nice answer and, and speaks well to the question of authenticity. Um, I, this, um, I, I will kind of take advantage of my privilege as moderator here to ask my own question since it dovetails with, with Vasugi's question to do with the question of popularity and other, other genres and forms. And uh, I had the chance to speak to you earlier about uh, the other major tradition that you're working with, which is Baal music, Bengali folk music. And you had indicated growing up in Shantiniketan that Rabindra Shangit and Baal were the two dominant forms of, of music and how I think it would be helpful for our audience. It was definitely enlightening to me to hear of um, Tagore's engagement with uh, folk traditions, with Baal particularly, and also even um, such insights as the melody to Amar Shamar Bangla um, initially being a, a, of, of Baal origin. Um, could you speak to that, please? Um, firstly, what, you know, when we were growing up, we were allowed to only sing Robin Rath songs or listen to Robin Rath songs within the environment of Shantini Kitan and our school, Patrabhavun. But we were also uh, exposed to the bowels of Birghum, our district, uh, and they, they lived around us, they played around us, and they sang around us. And we saw that singing bowel songs were not um, frowned upon. If we sang Bollywood or, you know, it was like, no, but with bowel songs, it was full throttled singing and, and, and nobody really um, sort of frowned upon us. And that's how it sort of got into us. And later when, uh, you know, we, we, we read about Ruben Rath's thoughts and, you know, um, <clears throat> how he theorized <clears throat> his musicology. Uh, we must remember that Ruben Rath was one of the first Padralok from the Padralok section of the society then that actually uh, sort of worked with folk songs of Bengal, um, you know, uh, in the early part, of, you know, the Swadeshi movement, the early part of the 20th century. And he was um, responsible for bringing uh, out uh, the baul, you know, uh, into the Bhadrulak Samaj and, and, you know, talking about the music, borrowing from their music and creating songs that could be sung, that could be uh, resonated with a large uh, a popula a population of the Bengali audience. And Rubinath wrote about <coughs> uh, the, ba uh, the Baal uh, songs. Rubinath wrote a big introduction to a book uh, uh, collected, uh, a Baal song book uh, of collected Baal songs. So along with Kiti Mohan Chen, Rubinath himself collected <coughs> Baal songs. And, you know, he was, as, as far as uh, I, I know very less, you know, it's not false humility, whatever I have known up till now, that he was more uh, sort of uh, enchanted by the musical uh, part of the Baal <coughs> community which uh, more than the esoteric practices of the community, he was more into their musical, um, the secular fabric of their musical endeavors and of their songs. So I suppose in that way, um, Robin Rana <coughs> is, excuse me, is a very much Robin Rana's songs and his, his, you know, ideas of his humanism, um, uh, and his ideas sort of match with the Baal uh, philosophy of syncret uh, syncretism, I suppose. And since he was one of the first to sort of bring out that into the society, uh, I think he's very much, you know, attached to the, to the musical tradition of the Baals. And, you know, a lot of, you know, there's, you know, Bengali articles written about the Robindra Baul, Robi Baul, and I think the musicologist Jean Openshaw had written a lot about Tagore, Baul Tagore, Baul Rabindranath, you know, so there's a lot of a discourse that surrounds uh, Bauls and their um, inspiration and influence on Rabindranath's music. 
Thank you. And it's really important to acknowledge that contribution from Tagore as well. And as we discussed earlier, also his his early translations of Kabir. Yes. Um, and uh, a lot of, of the things he brought to the public's attention. Um, I think we only have time for one more question. There are so many comments and a lot of praise I see in the Q and A box. Um, but Thank this you. question uh, is is from an anonymous attendee. Um, and that's okay, uh, but it, it has to do with uh, Tagore's music teacher, uh, Jodu Nath Bhattacharjo, um, or Bhattacharjo, oh, yeah. oh, yes. um, of the Bishnupur Garana. And if, uh, if you wanna say something about the sort of legacy of, of Tagore's um, training, uh, the question is um, your thoughts on, on some of his works, especially a lot of his compositions are based on raga um, and, uh, yeah, and so um, to place Tagore in, in, a, in a lineage, as it were. Uh, to start with, he did not want to place himself uh, in a lineage, and he wanted, there was, there was a conscious effort from his part to depart from the Hindustani classical music tradition. Uh, and, you know, Dilip Kumar Rai and Jyoti Prashad Mukhopadhyay, the debates, always debating on music, Tagore constantly told him that, you know, but Bengalis have the Bishnupur Gharana. You know, Jodhu Bhatto was there in Jodhachako when you were growing up, we talk about it. And he sort of always said that, you know, no, no, I have not been trained in music. He, Jodhu Bhatto used to sing and I used to listen from outside and that's how I learned classical music. And what I'm doing, you know, in his his defense of his own music. He said, what I'm doing is something that is uh, new. You know, yes, I have taken from the North Indian classical Gurana and, you know, uh, you know, Esraj players and classical musicians from the Bishnupur Gurana was employed by him in his school and university in Shantaniketan. He was very fond of it. But then he was consciously, consciously also trying to sort of to, of course, push his own case for his own new music that he calls Amar Adunik Gan, my modern music. He always wanted to, you know, like Chotajitra had said, you know, to rely on the non-academic, anti-lineage, anti-gharana, sort of instinctive musicality, I suppose. But he actually says, he writes that, but after all this, I could not, um, uh, you know, get away from the classical tradition. And I have to put ragas in my song. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Ramon. And, and there's so much more uh, to be said, especially this sort of very self-reflexive awareness of his, the modernity and the modernism of, of his project and his work. Um, I wanna thank all, all of the, of the attendees and listeners around the world, but most of all, Shohana, Bajpai, and I would like to remind everyone that the program continues till February 14th. So please join us again. And if you miss anything, you'll find videos of all of this and tonight's performance as well um, on our website. Thank you very much. Yeah.